Hey, 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 we're back, we're black, we're extra brown, ambition, 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 ambition. I'm super excited because we're super brown in the studio today. We have a special guest. You might know him. He's an OG in the game. Y'all be calling me OG, call me auntie. And I'm like, meanwhile, you're 35, sis. You're pressing it. Um, but Ramit is awesome. You probably heard of Ramit Sethi. He has a new show on Netflix. Matter of fact, let me look at his bio. Well, actually, let me tell you a quick story of how I first learned about Ramit. I was in either I was in high school or I was in college, and my sister brought home this book and was like, "Oh my gosh, I know Daddy teaches us about money, but it's dry." This guy is hilarious, and his parents are also not, you know, from America. And so she was like, he has like this, like, like my parents are immigrants, um, like um, mindset, and it's hilarious and just very relatable. And I was like, really? What's it called? And it was called "I Will Teach You to Be Rich" by Ramit Sethi. So I have been a stand and a fan for many years, and he really helped to kick in the door for brown people in finance. So let me tell you a little bit more about Ramit. Ramit is the host of Netflix's hit show, How to Get Rich, and the author of the New York Times bestseller, I Will Teach You to Be Rich. Ramit is known for his unconventional insights on money, psychology, and his no-nonsense approach to designing and living a rich life, okay? Born in California to Indian immigrant parents, he attended Stanford. Oh, he's a smarty. That's why I forgot about that on scholarship, <laughs> where he studied technology, psychology, and persuasion, earning undergraduate and graduate degrees. Rami began his company, I Will Teach You To Be Rich, from his college dorm room in 2004. His goal was to reframe the way we think about money. So in 2009, he published his book, his first book, I Will Teach You To Be Rich, which quickly became a New York Times bestseller and cemented his reputation as a leading voice in personal finance. Ramit also hosts a popular podcast called I Will Teach You To Be Rich, which features real couples sharing real stories with real numbers from behind closed doors. His influence in the personal finance space has continued to expand with his recent release of Netflix, How to Get Rich, which became an instant top 10 Netflix show. When I tell you how hard that is, I don't think y'all understand because I'll be doing my, my, my Googles and my numbers and that is really hard to do um, to get to be in the top 10 because Netflix at any moment has like hundreds of thousands of shows. So the show features Ramit's trademark practical and actionable advice, and follows him as he helps real people transform their finances and take control of their financial futures. Ramit's financial philosophy is centered around several key principles, including the importance of automating your finances, love that, using money psychology to prioritize your money dials, super love that, and focusing on $30,000 questions instead of $3 ones. The shade is real, but the $3... I feel so bad for the latte guy. I'm not going to say his name because we're not going to shade him. But that poor latte guy, I mean, it was, a, at the time, it seemed like a good idea. So welcome to the stew, me. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah, I'm so excited. I don't think I've ever met you in person, like, just like via social media. Is that right? Yeah, I don't think I've, we've ever, I don't think, I'm looking at you, I'm like, mm, no. FinCon? Like, <laughs> no, not even FinCon, no. I don't think we've. We were ever at a, or if I was at a FinCon back then, I didn't, I mean, I knew of you, but I didn't know you, so. Oh, man. Well, yeah. it's a pleasure to see you in person. <laughs> oh, this is awesome. So, well, one, I want to take it back to 2009, mm. right? What made you, like, write this book, like this funny, helpful book when no one was writing books to young people about money? Like, how, what was the impetus to all of that? Honestly, one of the biggest reasons I wrote it was I had, I was getting the same 10 questions every day of my life. <laughs> I was like, I don't want to answer a question about a Roth IRA anymore. Here, here's the book. It's going to answer your question and it's going to actually show you the 30 other questions you really should be asking. Mm -hmm. So that was one reason. I had started my blog in college and I started it because, not because I had some grand master plan. It was that I was, I'd taken some of my scholarship money, put in the stock market, lost half of it, realized I wasn't as smart as I thought. And as I learned about money and I was studying human behavior, persuasion, psychology, I started developing my own point of view on money. And so when I tried to teach my college friends about personal finance, they all were like, yeah, that sounds cool. And then they would never show up. <laughs> and this was free, free classes that I was giving away. And I did that for a year and a half. 
Nobody came. It was very demoralizing mm -hmm. when you have something that you feel the world needs to hear, but nobody is listening. Mm -hmm. And I realized this was a very pivotal moment. I could just give up, but I was a little arrogant. You know, in my, I was a 20 year old kid. I go, they need to hear this. <laughs> Maybe I'm not sharing it in the right way. Maybe okay. college kids don't want to come to events about money, even if they're free. And I later learned that's true. People don't like going to events about money. It makes mm -hmm. them feel bad about themselves. Mm -hmm. So I started a blog, spent five years plus on the blog, every day writing, treating it like a lab. And by the time it came time to even think about doing a book, I had talked to hundreds of thousands of people mm -hmm. and really refined this system for saving money automatically, for investing, even knowing how to calculate how much to save for a wedding or buying a house or a car. And those things I was ready to share with the world. Oh, that's awesome. So did they, were you approached about the book or did, were, is that something you pitched? Uh, I was approached at the time around 2006. There were some publishers who started reaching out. W one of the things I think I have a skill uh, th that just, I don't know where it came from, but I'm very patient. I'm okay. not in a rush for anything. I love that. So I knew, you know, if you come knocking on my door, you're probably not the kind of person that I want to publish my book. I was very patient. And I had built some relationships with people in the publishing industry. I had interned for Seth Godin. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I made friends with his agent. Mm -hmm. And I called a lot of people and asked, like, should I write a book? Should I not? And a lot of the advice, the same advice I give people now who are thinking about writing a book is, I say, slow down. Write a book when you're absolutely ready. Yep. When you feel like you have to write a book. Yeah. Be clear about why. It's not so you can see your book in a bookstore. That is a, that's a sort of very um, surface level goal. Mm -hmm. I had something that I knew the world needed to hear. I had refined it over years. I didn't care about money from a book. In mm -hmm. fact, I took a pretty small deal. My publishing deal for I Will Teach You to Be Rich first edition was quite modest. Okay. I chose a publisher that paid less, but I chose them because just like me, they are known to invest for the long term. Okay. So 80% of their sales come from the backlist. That's exactly what I wanted. And, um, and so that is how I decided to sell my book in 2007, and I started writing it for the next two years. No, I love that. Because I honestly, your book was one of my you... Um, Tim Ferriss. Um, I remember telling my, cause same, I was like, mm, I mean, the money's cool, but I make plenty of money externally, you know? So, and I also knew enough to know that, I mean, very few people get quote unquote rich off of books, you know, just because people don't know that even if you get, like, I got a good size, um, you know, um, like my deal was a pretty decent size, but it was over two years. I'm like, I make more than that. Yeah. you know, in a few months. So it, it wasn't the money. It was, because I'd been approached prior, but it was also, I just was like, I didn't, I wasn't really sure about what I wanted to say. And I didn't want to just be talking to be talking. And so finally I was ready to do my book. Um, so one thing that you are known, well, I don't know if you're, well, I'm sure you know you're known for this, is that you like to shake the table, right? Rami is like, yeah. What do you mean? I'm a little teddy bear. What are you talking about? I mean, I, I, I'm known as the greatest Indian teddy bear online. What are you talking about? Yo, Rami loves to shake the table. And what I love is that you, you're like, you're not going to back down from, from like, you're like, I said what I said, and this is why. So well, I would like would, to. Wait, hold on. Why would, why would I back down when I'm right? Exactly. That's, what what are we talking about? See, this, look at the teddy bear coming out with it, with the razor blade behind his back. And so I would love to talk about some of the things that people push back the, like the most with you on as they're listening. Okay. And like, you know, and then how, you know, like, why is this your, so there's something for me, for example, I've been doing a lot of research on the racial wealth gap and like, how do we get here? And so for those of you who don't know, the racial wealth gap, typically when they think the racial wealth gap, they're thinking the gap between white families and black families, which right now is like, for every dollar a white family has, a black family has, well, for every $10 a white family has, a black family has $1. And figuring out, like, how do we get here? And one of the components um, that they cite as, the, as being part of the reason why there is a racial wealth gap is a lack of home ownership in the black community. Yeah. You know, and also, too, not just lack of home ownership, but also that homes are devalued. Like, just go look at Brooklyn, you know, when it was like, Black people teaming there, you know, homes were worth nothing. Like, I live in Newark. I mean, that's why I don't like to pick up my phone because every second someone is calling me to buy my home, which lets you know that gentrification is well on its way. But, you know, Newark is still largely black, but 
when that changes, the value of these homes will totally change. Um, so anyway, I was, I know you have this thing about like, um, you don't need home ownership to grow wealth. So I'm just curious about like, you know, just because as my studies, I'm doing research about like home ownership being cited as one of the reasons why there isn't wealth in black and brown communities. Yeah. Like, what is your theory on like, you know, well, you don't need home ownership. Is that because home, home ownership, maybe that was the, well, you tell me, like, why is it that you push back on home ownership? Okay. Um, first of all, I'm so glad that we get to talk about personal finance and race, personal mm -hmm. finance and politics, because money is political. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the biggest things that I get pushed, pushed back on, which is, I literally have, you know, some dude wearing Oakley's telling me, <laughs> stick to finance. I go, are you, are you actually, do you actually lack this level of intellect that you don't realize money is as political as it gets, the reason housing is expensive is political. The yeah. reason healthcare is expensive is political. The reason you drive a big ass truck is political. Mm -hmm. It's not just that you like the truck and it's got a Hemi engine. No, it's political. So when it comes to home ownership, I have a very strong point of view on home ownership mm -hmm. and it's multifaceted like home ownership is in this country. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people, they, they obsess over their marble uh, island, okay? They obsess over what color their cabinets are. What they really should ask questions about is, is why am I not allowed to build an ADU or a, a granny unit in my backyard? Why is that not legally allowed? Why am I not allowed to build multiple stories if I want to? Why am I required to have a gigantic back front yard that nobody uses mm -hmm. and I actually have to spend time and money to mow it? And by the way, what, did, what role did race play in all of these rules? Why is it that in America, single family homes are the, the American dream? Mm -hmm. Why is that? And most people have no idea. They never thought about this. They'd rather think about the color of their cabinets. So when you read books like The Color of Law, you realize that home ownership, redlining, yes. that home ownership has been a wedge to drive wealth for primarily white Americans mm -hmm. in this country historically. It's not an accident. It was intentionally done so. Mm -hmm. And so freeways were created in poor communities, and that has lasting effects, okay? Mm -hmm. Um for a lot of people, probably not listening to this podcast, maybe listening to Joe Rogan, that would be shocking. And uh, and many of them simply deny it. Well, if you try harder, then you can make more money. I'm sick of that shit. Yeah. That, we've all heard it. And if you actually understand history, if you've read a single history book, you know that that's not how it works. Um, there's not bootstraps when uh, they're running a freeway through your and, and intentionally dividing your neighborhood as yes. they did for decades. Now, let's talk about home ownership as an investment because that's mm -hmm. a, it's, it's a related but different concept. Mm -hmm. In America, we're obsessed with home ownership. We believe that if you rent, you're a loser. Mm -hmm. We believe, we even have phrases, borderline religious phrases. You're throwing money away on rent. Mm -hmm. You're paying your landlord's mortgage. Yeah. I call them religious because they lack any actual data. They're just words we repeat over and over and over until people actually start to believe them. Well, it turns out that home ownership is certainly one way that you can build wealth. Mm -hmm. And historically in our country, it has been a very powerful way to build wealth. That's not simply because homes themselves are great investments. It's that when people in this country buy homes, they become NIMBYs, not in my backyard. They prevent more housing from being built, therefore mm -hmm. artificially boosting the price and value of their house. Mm -hmm. And so they basically, like a diamond dealer, they limit how many diamonds flood mm -hmm. on the market. They limit how many houses. And so they buy a house for $200,000 and the value goes up. Mm -hmm. If the market were actually free and we could build as much housing as is necessary, their house would look much more like Tokyo, where mm -hmm. prices do not go way up. And instead, housing is like uh, any other commodity you buy. It depreciates, in my opinion, as the way it should. Okay. So the thing that people find controversial is that I say you should run the numbers on the biggest purchase of your life. Mm -hmm. And sometimes renting can be a superior financial decision 
to owning a house, which in my case, it absolutely is. Mm -hmm. No, and that makes sense. Because I I mean, so I'm, because people are like, I know they're like, Tiffany, you bought homes. I'm like, yes, but the caveat, y'all remember that I purchased the home I'm living in now. It was, it was a foreclosure, had been foreclosure for like, I don't know, like a year. And so I bought it directly from the bank. It was at the time worth like 300000 uh, I bought it for one eighty cash. Mm-hmm. So I did not have to worry about like, you know, like renovating or whatever. And so, and then I put one eighty into it. Um, so that brought my investment to three sixty. So it was around uh, worth about, I think I said 300 I think worth like three sixty three eighty. Um, you know, so I bought it really cheap. I didn't have to worry about a mortgage. Um, Newark, where I live, it has the lowest taxes in Essex County. So my tax at the time, I want to say like seventy five hundred. So I was like, okay. Um, and now I don't, you know, I didn't have a, a, a mortgage. Um, and now the house, because everything was so crazy, is worth you know like five hundred, five twenty. Um, especially now, just because you know everyone's trying to gentrify Newark. Um, and then I purchased another home a few, like almost around the same time, directly from the city, a tax deed for ten thousand dollars. And I put one hundred and thirty into it, and I recently just sold it for. Uh, two seven two ninety five, mm-hmm. and so but those are not. I tell people that like I mean obviously that, that those deals are not available all the time. And but I, to your point, I try to be patient because I have to run the numbers. I did not run the numbers on my first property when I was twenty five. I bought a condo for two twenty. It went up to two twenty five, and then I bought it two thousand and um, six. And then the market just crashed and I lost it to foreclosure. And so I learned from that like oh up until then from two thousand. Six to like five years ago, I was still renting until I found something that that was going to make sense for me, you know, to purchase. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, um, I like that you are encouraging your listeners to run the numbers. Yes. And I, I want to share some numbers from my own example as well. Okay. So I've lived in San Francisco, New York City, and LA, and high cost of living cities and high cost of living neighborhoods within those cities. I like to live in a nice place. Mm-hmm. And I could go and buy a house today cash in any of those cities. I choose to rent. Mm -hmm. So when people hear this, it's like somebody telling them the sky is green. They're like, wait, the I will teach you to be rich guy rents? And they're shocked. Why? Because again, in our country, deep down, we believe that owning is for successful people and renting is for losers. And so when they look at me, they go, well, this guy has a show on Netflix. and He's got this best-selling book. How can he rent? That's a moment where they start to question some of the beliefs that have been passed on to us for generations. You got to own a house. You got to build equity. So let me tell you, when I was living in New York, I kept an extremely close eye on real estate values. Okay. okay? Uh, a couple of things I want to share that might surprise people. First off, uh, my rent dropped four times in 11 years. It dropped. Okay? Yes. People in America think rent only goes up. Wrong. <laughs> Just like the price of anything. Rent is governed by supply and demand, but guess what? When I ask, they go, that's not possible. Rent never goes up. I go, number one, do you keep a close eye on real estate values in your market? They go, no. I go, number two, do you actually negotiate? They go, what's that? I go, then how the hell do you expect rent to drop if you yourself are not actually negotiating? Your landlord doesn't just walk in and drop your rent. Why would they? You got to ask and you got to have, you got to be lucky in the sense that there has to be more supply which there was in my case. Mm -hmm. And you know, you need to know your numbers. So that's number one. The second is there was an apartment building right next to us. And it had this, there was a unit there. It had this, in fact, several units, same number of bedrooms, same square footage, same view, Mm -hmm. all of it. It was very similar. Let's just say that I was paying $3,000 a month in rent, just as a hypothetical example. Mm -hmm. It would have cost me 2.2 times as much to own than it cost me to rent. So in other words, it would have cost me over $6,000 a month to own that place when I factor in all the phantom costs. Taxes, Mm -hmm. maintenance, Mm -hmm. interest, opportunity cost of my down payment, all the things that people never consider. So you know what I did? I took the $3,400 or so per month and I invested it. And I did that every month and I made way more money renting than I would have owning. So the the point is not that one one of us is doing it right or wrong. Yes. That's not the point. Point is, you got to run the numbers. Yes. This is the biggest purchase of your life. You can't spend more time deciding what appetizer you're going to get on Friday night than understanding a multi-hundred thousand dollar purchase. Yeah. You've got to run the numbers. 
I don't wonder why people. I always thought those strengths. I was looking. I, I recently got a condo, bought, purchased a a condo, and I was thinking to myself. I remember I wanted to see it multiple times because I like I wanted to bring some of my real estate investors by. It. And I remember like after the third time, they were like, "Again?" I'm like, "You want me to spend?" All this money, I literally would try on a dress at Target more times. There you go. I just thought that was so bananas to me. Yeah. They were like, honestly, I mean, why do you need to see it again? I'm like, this is like the most expensive purchase I, I've ever made. Yeah. And I'm like, I would literally sometimes be like, oh, I don't know if I really want that jean skirt. Or hmm, which pair of Jordans do I really like? I will try on things over and over. And to me, it is really wild the way some people literally see a house one time. It's and wild. they're like, I'm going to put in an offer. I love ironing clothes. I love it. And when I am researching a new iron, which I do once every 15 years, I will spend like days watching every YouTube review. I'm like going, I'm going, I'm literally going to the store. I don't go to that many stores and I'm picking it up. Does it fit my hand correctly? How does it, how's the weight? Hmm. Is it going to get, and I'm spending that level of time on a $150 purchase. Okay. Okay. Yeah, you better imagine if we're going talking about a million dollar plus purchase that I'm going to be spending a lot of time. We all should. Yeah. We should know what an amortization table is. Yeah. Nobody knows what that is. Most people go, oh, I'm building equity. I go, have you ever looked at an amortization table? Have you ever realized that in the first roughly 10 years yeah. of owning, you're primarily paying off interest? Yeah. And I, when I post this on my social media, I actually show the chart. I showed a real example, real interest rates, real everything. And you know the reaction? People get mad at me. <laughs> Why? Because in many ways, it's religious. We don't want to think about the facts. Yeah. We simply want to be reassured by father government and father, mom and pa telling us buying is the right decision. And I reject that. I reject the idea that we should only buy because everyone tells us it's good and they use these handy dandy phrases. No, you got to actually know the numbers. And it may turn out that buying is great. For a lot of people, buying is a great decision. For a lot of people, renting is a great decision. Mm -hmm. You decide, but you need to know your numbers. So what others, what are some other things that push people push back on that you're like, I don't care. The numbers say this. It's like men lie, women lie. Numbers don't. What are some other, that's the biggest one that I've seen people push back on you for. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have what any else? Other what else do you notice? Um, well, like it's hard because most of like, there isn't anything that I push back. I mean, the, the home one, I'm always just like, it just really depends. But I mean, people push back on me about like whole life insurance, you know, Yeah. I get that, you know, about like, you know, and I'm just like, the numbers don't make any sense. Wait, uh, whole life insurance is shit. Who pushes back on you? Oh, whole life insurance salesman. Oh, yeah, wow. <laughs> <laughs> like I care. These guys. Oh, okay. I'll tell you. Um, first of all. <laughs> You you should trust a whole life insurance salesperson as far as you can throw them. <laughs> there, there's zero reason. And you know, the only reason that people go, um, whole life insurance is great if you're really wealthy. I go, I have a lot of money and it's not even good for me. Yes. So please g give me a break. Whole life insurance, avoid that. One big pushback that I get is when I advise avoiding 1% fees to a financial advisor. Mm -hmm. So I shared this on my Netflix show. I had a guest, Natalie, who had a multi-million dollar portfolio and she was paying one plus percent to a financial advisor. Mm -hmm. And you know who gets really mad at me when I say this? Financial, financial advisors. advisors. <laughs> <laughs> they get really mad. But uh, let me tell you why, because I think there's some nuance to it. First off, I believe that most people can manage their own money. Mm -hmm. Most people have quite simple financial situations and there are very simple, amazing investments like target date funds mm -hmm. that are phenomenal and simple and low cost. Mm -hmm. You set it up once and you automate it. You never have to think about it again. And yep. you can become quite wealthy from things like a target date fund. Now, once in a while, people do have complicated financial situations. They might have stepchildren. They might have inheritance issues, mm -hmm. whatever. And they want to get a second set of eyes. I don't mind it. I myself have hired a financial advisor. Mm -hmm. In my case, I hired one because I wanted them to look at my asset allocation and tell me if, am I missing anything? Do I have any blind spots? So I don't mind if you hire a financial advisor. I don't even mind if you pay a premium rate, mm -hmm. 200 an hour, 500 an hour, mm -hmm. 1,000 an hour. If you like them and they're qualified, pay it. 
but never a percentage. Yes. So what most people don't understand, if you have a financial advisor and you're watching or listening to this, go ahead and text your advisor, email them and say, hey, I just want to know, can you send me the fee schedule? What that means is how am I paying you? If you went to a restaurant, of course, you know how you're paying. You're paying with your credit card. You know how you're getting charged. It's, you know, 20 bucks for an entree or whatever. And that's that. What if you found out that the person mowing your lawn is charging you a percentage of your net worth or a mm -hmm. percentage of your investable assets? That would be crazy. Mm -hmm. So how is it that it's okay for the financial advising industry to do so? And let me also share another shocking fact. 1% doesn't sound like a lot. Ooh, 1%, somebody can look over my investments and keep an eye on it. 1% means that over the course of your lifetime, you will spend about 28% of your returns in fees. Mm. That's shocking. Mm -hmm. That's hundreds of thousands of dollars. We have so many people preoccupied with a $3 latte. <laughs> oh, I shouldn't get dessert, the cheesecake. I know I'm being good. I should be good this week. <laughs> Meanwhile, you're being bled dry yeah. for hundreds of thousands of dollars and you don't even realize it. Yeah. I don't find that acceptable. It, now, if you want to pay 500 bucks an hour mm -hmm. or you want to spend $5,000 on a project-based fee, I'm all for it. Yeah. In fact, I would do that. I have a person who works for me and they offered me two options. Do I want to pay a high hourly rate or do I want to pay a percentage of the deal? Mm -hmm. I said, I'll pay the hourly rate every day, yeah. every day. So uh, I want to encourage you to find out if you are paying, if you have a financial advisor, how are you paying? It's often 1%. They, uh, and you can tell because they won't give you a straight answer. Mm. And I don't want people to be paying AUM or assets under management mm -hmm. fees. I want you to be either managing your money yourself, or if you're paying a great advisor, pay them hourly or per project. Yeah. That gets a lot of pushback, but I'm right. <laughs> no, and I, I mean, I, that, that's why I didn't push back on that because I have a Anjali. Shout out to you, Anjali. She's amazing. She's my financial advisor and I pay out of pocket. That was one of the things I, I don't even know that, I, I never even asked if she offered like assets under management, but I think I made it very clear in the beginning, we're not doing that. So yeah. it never really came up. I Good. just said, you know, what's the, you know, and I'm not going to lie in the beginning, just like you, I was like, who is a financial advisor? It's not that serious. Most things are set it and forget it. Um, but I just got stuck in a space where I'm like, I'm really good at making money, but I didn't really know, like, what do I do now that it's building and building and building? You know, I wanted to understand, like, what, where's the best place to place my assets in a way so I wouldn't have to work by the time I was a certain age. Mm -hmm. um, and so Anjali was pivotal for me. Um, and so I'm really grateful that I hired her. Maybe I want to say like four years ago, um, especially after my husband suddenly passed away. I don't know what I would have done without Anjali because she knew where everything was. You know, yeah. like he had a pension, which is very rare because he worked for the city of Newark. And so the paperwork for the pension is like, you. it doesn't even make sense. It's Latin. But somehow she speaks Latin. So she knew, like even before they knew, she's like, no, you are supposed to get this. This is supposed to go for your stepdaughter, this is supposed to, you know, and so she just was, so it changed my tune about financial advisors because I was reluctant even to hire her because I just felt like you're paying someone to do something you could probably do yourself, but, you know, and, and I still think the average person, to Ramit's point, doesn't necessarily need one, or if you do, start with an hourly, and just so you so someone can look over your things and you could say, oh, thanks for that information. Um, so Anjali doesn't just look at my personal finances, I, I've also hired her to look at my you know, business thing. She's kind of like a last set of eyes because she's a CPA as well. And so it allows me to use it as a business expense. So I don't even have to pay out of pocket for her, which is great. But yeah, so that wasn't to me like a, I mean, I guess maybe financial advisors would be mad, but I'm trying to think anything else I see people because for me be on Twitter on fire. Okay. He does not care. I love that because I uh, am true. somebody who cares. <laughs> I, I, am, I am pretty good at Twitter. <laughs> you are good. I keep I keep waiting for one day when there's going to be an actually intelligent troll that comes after me. I've been on it for about 15 years and I'm like, anybody out here? I'm wait. You know what? I'll tell you this though, because you know, the internet rule is like, don't respond to trolls. And I respond to like every single one. But I, I'll tell you because it keeps me sharp. I do like to hear the other perspective and it's true. Hey, maybe there are things I haven't considered. Uh, maybe there are elements of an argument that I haven't considered. So I do want to hear that. What it unfortunately turns out to be the case is I just typically hear from right-wing anti-vaxxers who think they're smart but have never actually, you know, looked at 
a number or a piece of data. So it becomes less interesting, although quite entertaining. Well, let's switch over. Let's talk about your um your your Netflix um show. So when it came out, I was like, amazing, because I'd heard buzz through the through the through the grapevine, you know, because when I was doing the documentary, um, yeah. I'd congratulations heard, for that, by the way. I saw that, you know, I reached out to you. I said, <laughs> yeah, Wow. I know you did. <laughs> that was so cool. Yeah, I was, was really fun. happy for you. Yeah. Thank you. No, it was a lot of fun. I didn't think, I don't know. I wasn't sure if I would want to tape something just because I was nervous, like, am I going to enjoy it? Is it going to feel like too taxing on top of, because you have a business too, yeah. you, you know, you're already busy. So I was nervous and it wasn't just me. Obviously there was three other amazing financial um, educators. So it didn't feel super overwhelming. I want to say it was about a year and a half of taping. So how did it come about? Was it something that they hit you up? I mean, obviously I know it's like years in the making typically. And I'd heard through the grapevine that there was something that Netflix was coming up with, which I'm so glad you know, that they put their foot out there to say people want to see financial education, like on, you know, on, on this bigger scale. So how did that come about, that that show? Uh, Netflix emailed me. Okay. And I still remember where I was. I still remember the email. And they reached out and said, hey, we'd love to set up a meeting and discuss, you know, some possibilities. Do you have representation or should we communicate directly and I remember going like, what's representation? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I was not Mr. Hollywood. I, I'm an internet guy, right? Mm -hmm. That's why I'm good at Twitter. I know email. Like I've been on the internet for a long time, but I don't know anything about Hollywood, especially at the point where this email came in. So I, I actually didn't even believe it was from them. I went up to the from line and I clicked it so it would expand. And it said at Netflix.com. Mm -hmm. And I was shocked mm -hmm. because often the emails come from ambulance chasers and production companies and mm -hmm. other folks, but this was directly from the network. So I took it downstairs. I took my phone. I showed my wife and I was like, what do you, like, I don't even know what to say. <laughs> and she's awesome because she, uh, she said, what do you think? And she just let me talk. And I kind of talked out loud. Okay. And the th here's what I was feeling at the time. I was feeling, number one, really surprised. Mm -hmm. I never, ever planned to be a TV guy. Never. Okay. I never woke up saying, I want to be famous or I want to be on TV. I just, I like uh, helping people live a rich life. I like telling jokes online. <laughs> I like my readers and my students. I love them and I love my team. That's what I know. But I also know that I've been doing this for 20 years. Mm. And I know my business pretty well. So at this point, it was it made me nervous to even contemplate doing something where I would lose some control. Because once you do a show, it's out of your control. Yes. You know? But at the same time, it was like, wow, I could take my message to a massive audience. Mm -hmm. You know, I look around on the street, whether I'm in LA, New York, wherever, and most people don't know the concept of a rich life. They mm -hmm. don't know how I talk about it. And I think they should. And so I, I said, all right, at least I'm going to take the call. I'm going to take the call. And uh, I got on a call with them and they were very pleasant. They were very flattering. They're like, we know your work. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, you know, we read your book in the office. In fact, we hand it around. And I was like, let me stop you right there. Whatever deal we were going to do, the price just quadrupled. <laughs> <laughs> and they were laughing. But in my head, I was like, but I'm not kidding, though. <laughs> so, so, you know what I realized the whole time? The whole time, starting from that call mm -hmm. through even right now, I said, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to have fun. Okay. And if I'm having fun, everybody else is having fun. And that that's my motto now. I'm 40 years old. I'm going to have fun doing big projects. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that shows. It shows when I'm on screen because I'm actually having fun with my guests. Even when they're, you know, being a little nutty, <laughs> I'm having fun. And then they're having fun. And that's that's where I think that um, I want to go, you know, with the work that I do. So how how many, how long was the taping? Was it like a year and a half, two years? Um, it took, okay, so it took a while for us to uh, solidify the deal. Okay. And I was loving it because, I was like, take as much time as you need. More time for me to get in shape. More time for me to fix my website. I was like, yeah, no rush, no rush. I was taking two, three days to respond to emails. I was like, no, let's slow it down. And so we find, so we finally, um, we finally got a date. Okay. 
we're going to start shooting. My wife is a personal stylist, so okay. she agreed to help style me for the entire show. Oh. And uh, I remember going in, I was getting some pants made. I really love clothes, by the way. So I love spending money on clothes. I have a few things I call money dials, the things where I really love spending and turning that dial up. Mm-hmm. We all have money dials. Yes. One of mine is clothes. So I went in to get these pants made. And I was, they're like, okay, let's, let's measure you. I'm like, listen, uh, I'm going to drop this much weight before the shooting. So I need you to alter the, like, make sure that you adjust. And they looked at me like, like kind of like pity. They're like, this guy's so delusional. Oh my gosh. He really thinks he's going to lose. Like, uh, and I was like, listen, just make the pants the way I'm saying. Okay. I know exactly what I'm going to do is I'm a professional. I've done this before. I know what it takes. I have a trainer. So I came back in a few months later, they had made the pants as I requested. Mm -hmm. And just to mess with them, I went in the fitting room and then I was like, oh my God, it doesn't fit at all. And everyone, there's like eight people, tailors, all these people from Italy, just to mess with them. And then I came out and it fit perfectly. So again, I'm having fun. Uh, In terms of shooting, we shot principal shooting for about four months. That was That's all it. around the country. Yeah. Okay. Um, all around the country, 14 hour days, very busy, very intense. I've never worked as intensely mm-hmm. as on that. It was actually really fun, very exhilarating. Okay. And then we did about five months in post. Okay. Uh, and then it was ready to go. Is it, has your life like, because I saw your book was like number one on Amazon, which just for context, y'all, at every given any given moment, there's like a million plus books being sold on Amazon. Like, well, so Tiffany, to, as far as I'm concerned, there's only two books, yours and mine, on Amazon. <laughs> They're the only ones that matter. <laughs> but I was like, because I'm like, I'm like a stalker of like successful people, so I'm always like, you know, just low key. I just be checking people's numbers. They don't even know me. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I do because I want to know like what's all, what's T. I'm like, oh, interesting. <laughs> if it was, and then I slow. I'm always slightly judgy. Oh, if it was me, I would have done that. Or <laughs> like, I'll like, or I'm I'm like. Really, like to me, my biggest pet peeve is somebody has a book. Let's just say it's called, you know, I Walk the Dog, you know, and like you, you're you telling the people, buy my book everywhere books are sold. I'm like, you mean, why don't you own IWalkTheDog.com or IWalkTheDogBook.com? I mean, for the love of God, make it easy for me to find it. And so like, I just love to see when someone, to, to your point, I don't know how many people would have had this thing happen and not had anything ready. Yo, I was ready when, yeah. when, ne- and that was just a part of a documentary. I mean, like we updated the site. I captured so many emails, so many, because you're like, you're like, you're an online person, same. And so like how, I mean, I saw for my own self, how your journal like sold out everywhere, how your book just exploded. Um, but like what other kind of like, I'm sure those are things you expected. Anything unexpected where you were like, whoa. Like, yeah. would you walk down the street now? Like, were you like, hey, is that Ramit before? And they're like, it's definitely Ramit now. Yeah, I think a lot of things um, change in a really positive way. I'm okay. very thankful for it. Um, so uh, my podcast called I Will Teach You To Be Rich, mm-hmm. that went to number five on all of Apple. And What? That's yeah, amazing. that was like shocking. And it it's just attracted so many people, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, Of course, you know, we had the stuff that we expected. Um, Lots of people come to the website, lots of Mm -hmm. people following us on social, joining our email newsletter. I love all of that. Mm -hmm. I think the podcast was really surprising. And I'll tell you something else. Um, You know, I've, I lived in New York for a long time. So people would recognize me if I was out on a Saturday, I would definitely get recognized a few times. Mm -hmm. That number has exploded. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people coming up, but also the type of people coming up to me, Mm. incredibly diverse, incredibly. Mm. I'm walking in the Lower East Side. I'm getting people coming up to me. I'm walking on the Upper East Side, Upper West. I'm getting different types of people coming up to me. Mm. People that I did not get coming up before. Okay, There's some people who are just never going to follow a newsletter or social media about money, but they'll watch it on How to Get Rich on Netflix. And so I'm thankful for that. Uh, and they're always, they're always really nice. They have the best stories. They're super thankful. Uh, mm-hmm. they, they'll say like one, it's like comical because I'll be walking with my wife and someone will be like, thank you. Oh, I love and I'm that. like, that's like pretty dramatic. <laughs> like, all right, thank you. <laughs> but it reminds me because I don't go up to celebrities if I see anyone yes. who I think is a celebrity. I'm like, oh, what am I going to say? I don't want to be a dork. So I just walk right past him. And um, the, only, the only celebrity I ever went up to 
was this guy Marcus Lemonis. He used, yes. He's on CNBC, yep. The Prophet. Yeah. And I, I like him a lot. And um, I saw him this at this burger place that I went to, and. My, I was like, oh my God, it's Marcus Lemonis. And my wife's like, you got to go take a picture with him. I'm like, no, I can't. I can't. And he was in a place, like it was a public place. He was meant to be greeted. He was promoting one of his businesses. Okay. So I went up to him and I was sweating. And I was like, Marcus, I'm such a fan. I watch your show every week. And then I, can I get a photo? And I did exactly what other people do. So you know what? I turned into like a blubbering <laughs> idiot. And that's why I have so much respect for anyone who comes up. Yes. Because I'm like, that takes a lot of courage. It does. I don't have that courage. It does. So anyway, thanks to everyone who watches and, and listens and follows. I love that, honestly. That's probably my favorite thing. Because I'm a people person. So I love that people come up. There. I mean, my, my audience is on purpose largely black women. And they're just like the yeah. best. Because oh, they're so like, girl, I love you, girl. I'm like, love you too. And so they're so <laughs> supportive. So So every once in a while, though, it won't be... Like, it'll be a white guy that comes up to me. And I'm always shocked, like, what? That's cool. Well, how, but how did you find me, Timothy? <laughs> 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 Is your wife black? You Timothy, know, so that, Timothy <laughs> goes, I listen to Brown Ambition. <laughs> I know. And you'd be surprised. <laughs> I honestly, so that's been happening more and more, like, which is so crazy because I mean I always say I don't turn anyone away, you mm -hmm. know, but I started this work specifically because I'm like, there's a gap here and I needed this. And so, yeah, no, I, I think that is definitely my favorite part. It's just like knowing that your work is getting out there and yeah. that people who likely would not normally be touched and moved yeah. by it get moved and touched by it. So I love that. I love that. And I also, I also love the, the representation. Like when right. I, I, I was in Vegas recently and there was an Indian family that mm. came up to me and I just loved it because they, there were two parents and they had their son and daughter and, um, when I when I grew up, when I was a kid, there were no Indian superheroes mm -hmm. that I knew of. Superhero was like Clark Kent, mm -hmm. white guy with big muscles. And I didn't see anyone who looked like me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we know what representation is and mm -hmm. why it matters. But as a kid, you, you don't realize, you just internalize like, oh... Um, it's big white guys that have muscles, mm -hmm. but me, I do spelling bees. Yes. Okay. And I did spelling bees and I dominated and that was great. But it wasn't until my twenties where I finally realized if I want to change my body, I can, mm -hmm. and I can learn how to eat differently and work out differently. And I can get help from friends and trainers and stuff like that. So I think it's cool. I, I love seeing this Indian family come up and say hello and take a picture because their kids, who yes. were probably 12, see a guy, they go, this, this Indian guy's on TV. Mm -hmm. He looks like me. You know, he, maybe I can do that. Mm -hmm. Maybe the possibilities are bigger than what I had realized for myself. So to me, that's like a very, um, very meaningful part of doing what I do. I just think too, I think, because I'm sure you're, you know, I know that, um, the parenting in the Indian household is very similar to parenting in yes. um, African households, which yeah. is you have a few professions you can do. Doctor, mm -hmm. lawyer, engineer, pharmacist, or drug dealer. Because that's what my dad thought. He was like, anything else, you're clearly dealing drugs. I'm like, but I'm a teacher. He was like, drugs. <laughs> <laughs> drugs and disappointment. I'm like, what? <laughs> And Amazing, so, but now I'm so I'm, I'm um, one of five girls, and Lisa's the baby. Although she's not a baby, she's in her early thirties. My mom was telling her the other day because Lisa is a typical baby, like oh this job, this job. And um, my mom was like, Lisa, why don't you? So my African name is Adochi. Why don't you do like Adochi and start a business? I was like, who who are you, woman? Yeah, because that I mean, the fact that that's even on the table now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, like. I just couldn't believe. So I love that there are, you know, Indian kids that are going to be able to point to you to say, I actually don't have to be a doctor, yeah. mom, dad. Like, look over me. Like, there is success in other areas. And we understand why our parents did that because they know yep. it's not easy being brown in this country. There are certain professions that you can, that can provide, pr like, safety for you or, like, yep. you know, professional success for you. But you get to widen that scope and they can say there is wild success you know, in other areas. So I love that. So yeah, yeah Remy, totally. thank you so much for coming on. You're awesome sauce. Where can the people find you? Can you share like your, your Netflix again, your book again, and anything else you want to share? Yeah. So if you are listening to this, you, you might also like my podcast where I bring couples on 
and you can actually see them. You can see their faces on YouTube, and I insist that they share all of their numbers. So you hear a couple with $800,000 of debt, they're concerned they can't afford to have children. You hear another couple where she, 21 years married, she's about to divorce him because he's too cheap. Their net worth, $13 million. What? Yeah, you get to actually listen in on couples with all over, all of the socioeconomic spectrum, all different kinds, um, talking about real money issues. That's called I Will Teach You To Be Rich. Mm -hmm. My book, I Will Teach You To Be Rich, you can find that on Amazon. Uh, you can find it uh, at any bookstore, including Barnes and Noble. And then of course the show, how to get rich mm -hmm. that's on Netflix and you can stream that anywhere in the world. So we had an awesome show, but stick around guys. Listen to the next show that will come out on Friday because Ramit's going to stay and do some B A Q A. All right. Until next week, y'all. Bye. Hey, 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 B A fan. We're on YouTube. Woohoo. Thank you so much for watching. Please like this video and subscribe to the channel. And while you're at it, why don't you go over to that little bell icon and just tap that for us. Show the BA fam how much you love us. And that way you'll also get notifications when new videos drop. Also share the channel with a friend. We're always like, tell a friend, tell a friend, tell a friend. And thank y'all so much again for all the support.